Okay, uh, let's let's continue. So, did anybody found out why the people are not getting older? Yes. That's correct. So the implementation of our function application. Uh, no, I don't want this one. Um, functions demo. I want this one. So in here, when we look when we iterate over the range of people what is p yep exactly it's a copy of the content of the array or slice or whatever you have in the range right so p is a copy of what is here Right, so then I'm getting a reference, but I'm getting a reference to the copy and I properly modify it. It is getting older, but it's not the actual person in the slice which is getting older. It's my copy which is getting older. So how can I solve it? There are two ways of solving it, but... Yep. That's right. So I can iterate over indexes in, instead of iterating over the values, which are by copy. That's one solution, which is the, probably, the, in my case, the easiest fix, because I will just have my index. And then I will say I need um, a people index. Make sense? Will that work? I think it will work. Let's um, let's save it. Let's run it. Um, go build. And functions demo. Yay! My people are getting older. OK, it works. So that's great. I will. Go back to the previous version for a second, um, and I will save it, and I will build it again, and I will see that it's not working. And I'm wondering, oh, I have a bug somewhere. My logic somehow is broken, right? And comes the metal inter, right? So why I'm so keen on those uh, metal inters? Christopher is not, but I am. Uh, Go lang ci run. And bang, it finds my bug, right? <laughs> it tells me, oh, look, you're doing something fishy because you're referencing a copy of the array that you're doing in the for loop with kind of probably something wrong, right? <laughs> so it found my bug in the code before I kind of run my code, right? Because I should run the metal inter every time I finish editing my code, right? Beautiful. I don't even need to debug my stuff. I see, oh yeah, there is a bug, right? So I go here, I change it to an index. Um, so a hey, people, I save it. Um, yeah, I don't need a second thing, so it already complains in the ID that I don't need the um, underscore. And then if I saved it, yes. And then if I run my metal inter now, it's clean, right? So now I build my code, uh, and now I run it, and I'm more likely to have it running correctly, right? Um, oops. Um, and it, people are getting older. So those metal inters are helpful because they will not only complain about various things about your 
indentations and what have you, but they will actually do a static analysis of your code and they will pick up places where you probably have a bug in your code. Um, so that's super useful. And this one was a good example of um, um, a scope lint uh, finding out that I'm kind of referencing a local variable which, I'm cop which I have by value, copied by value. So it kind of makes no sense um, to, um, to, to do that. Okay, um, so back to our question. Um, so we have it working. We need to solve the issue of me having this, um, modifying this function in such a way that I can pass a parameter from the user. How can I do that? How would you do that? So instead of uh, saying h is plus plus, I want to say h is plus number. I cannot do that here because, um, well, it kind of doesn't work, right? It's not in scope, right? So how can I do that? How can I say uh, up map func and I, um, I obtain the value from a, from the user and somehow I can pass a function which only takes one parameter but knows about the number. Well, one way of doing it is through closure, right? So if I write a function here uh, which takes um, a reference to a person, right? Um, I can say ph ah ph plus equals number. Now it works, right? Why it works? Well, because number is known. It's like I'm passing the number into this inner function from outside, right? It's in the same scope. Uh, so it's kind of in the same... Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know the other name, like... Yeah, yes? Disclosure, yes, they are. Yeah. All variables yeah. from here, I can I can use app as well. So I, I can do something with the app. Yeah. Which sucks, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, does this actually enter the, uh, the stack frame? No, if I don't use it, it doesn't, right? Only when I use it, it it's put onto the stack frame, right? So uh, all the other variables which I are here but I'm not using in my function are not actually in the stack frame for that function. The only the one which I'm actually using, right? Uh, but I can do that, right? Uh, and that's one way of passing a parameter to a function which doesn't have ability to pass an extra parameter, right? So how can I do this? Well, I can do this by basically rewriting it. Uh, uh, make older by a number, right? And we will pass a person and uh, number, which is an int. And then what we will do is we will say um, return. We will take this. We will say return this and here um, I will say this function returns a function which takes um, a reference to a person and returns nothing, right? Um, and now what I can say is I can delete that and say make uh, older by a number and I pass, I actually don't need, um, I don't need that at all. So I can pass a number. Correct? So now I, I kind of, I'm still using the library. I'm still using whatever I need to use. 
I just kind of made it flexible for myself that I can create the function the library expects dynamically based on whatever user puts me here, right? Uh, and I kind of have this uh, compound composite function which um, generates a new function which kind of uh, has this number in the stack frame, in the scope. And that's a very typical pattern. Where would you use it? Well, you will use it for your handlers, right? Your web server requires you to have a handler function which takes two parameters. That's it. There is no parameterization, right? But you often need to access a database. You often need to read the parameters. You often need to know what the app is, what the state of the app is to handle the request, right? How can you do that if you are not passing this in the parameters? Well, you do it by this, right? So you basically have another function which prepares whatever logic you need to do and returns the function which takes two parameters for your handler, right? Simple as that. Uh, so it's a very typical uh, functional pattern for uh, composing more complex things which require more things, but at the end you can pass the simple thing to where whoever needs it, right? My library needs a function which only takes a person. My library doesn't care about the number or the state of your app or whatever you're doing, right? So the library just wants a function which manipulates a person. How you do that, it's up to you, and that's how you can do that, right? All right, so any questions about this? I will uh, update this. So I will say make older by a number and initially we make everybody older by one and then they are made older by five and we also print them. So let's copy that. Uh, by V and we say number and we yeah let's let's try to compile it there is a bug right yeah let's first run the linter the linter doesn't detect anything let's try to build it well the builder doesn't detect anything neither uh, the bug is that I'm um, print lining something that has a uh, value but I'm using print line, right? What should I use? I should use print f, right? Correct? Unfortunately, they didn't uh, pick. Oh, yes. So it was not picking it up because um, it, yeah. So let's, let's do that again. Um, it, because I'm pretty sure Golang detects that. So if I do this. And I say up uh, people and number. Okay, let's try again. Yeah, you see, so linter already co covers that. So vetting says, look, you're using print line, but you're having a, um, those indicators that you should have variables here, and you have a variable list. Uh, so you're doing something wrong. In fact, if you try to build it, it should, no, uh, it actually builds. So if I remove those and run the linter, it will be fine, right? But with the, with these, the linter complains and I need to change into print. So, now the linter doesn't complain, it builds and it runs. It initially, everybody gets older by one year and then by five years. Perfect. So I will commit that. Um, main and types. Flexible. All right, so that's done. Uh, so now let's have a look at the Firebase demo. Um, Firebase demo. So we'll close this. Uh, 
Um, the Firebase demo is um, a little bit more complex. So I want to demonstrate a couple of things. So it's uh, it's the same as with... Um, so let's say... Um, it's, it's very similar to what Yona did. It's just that it's a little bit more refined and I'm using... Um, I'm using the structure type for storing students uh, and students have name, age and some coins. Um, and then I'm kind of having an interface for my database so my application can make persistence and I can test it with a mock database in memory database or with Firebase, right? So I have a flexibility of plugging in different databases uh, for testing purposes. Um, so I have um, a database which is based on the Fire, um, Firestore and I have another database which is basically nothing, which is just mock, which doesn't do anything, right? So for testing, I can plug in the mock and it will run really fast, it will not talk, not talk to the server or whatever. Um, and for uh, real things, I can test with the Firebase and have the Firebase um, <coughs> working. Um, so I, I've made this kind of a decision that I will have a generic interface for how I'm interacting with my database uh, and I have the initialization, I have to close it, I can save and delete and read and read by ID uh, kind of API and my Firestore implementation supports it and my mock also supports it. Um, so for the Firestore to work, I need the project ID, I need the collection name for what I'm storing the data in, and I need the handle to the client. It's the same as with Yona example. I'm just kind of uh, contextualizing it. In his example, it was kind of as global variables. Here I just keep it in the struct. Um, and then I have the implementation. So um, let's have a look at the uh, initialization. It's exactly the same as with Yona project. But um, he initialized it with a Firebase and said new app. Um, you can initialize it either way. So you can either initialize just the Firestore or you can initialize the entire Firebase. Um, I su suggest doing this uh, because there is a, a small possibility of you making buggy code because the Firebase API also has a database access. If you're using the Firebase Golang API for database, you will be using the real-time database, not the Firestore database, right? So you should, for access to the database, you need to use the Firestore um, client, not the client which the um, Firebase gives you. Uh, but either way is fine, and then Yona is using the Firestore API correctly in his example, and I'm, I'm kind of doing the same. Um, so, handling errors. Uh, one thing about handling errors. Um, how can you handle errors? So, let's say I'm initializing a database and something goes wrong. Firebase is not accessible or whatever. What options do you have? What can you do? You can panic. That's the worst thing. We don't panic in assignment two anymore, right? So, what else can you do? Yeah, you effectively have two options. Right. So one option is, it's an error which sort of doesn't really matter that much, we can continue. Therefore, I can print something to a screen or print something to a log and kind of continue, right? Uh, okay, we have three options. Um, second option is, it's an error that we completely cannot continue. Like it's uh, something is so totally wrong that we should um, do something serious about the app, right? It's a bug that should never happen, right? Um, then you can kind of uh, panic, but as we said, you should not panic, right? So we should reach the point where this option is not an option anymore, right? So therefore, you only have two options. So the second option is you escalate the error, right? So you, you say, okay, I have an error here. I don't know what whoever is calling me is doing, so I pass the error up the chain, right? That's what we're doing here. We're saying, if there is an error, we're passing the error up the chain, right? 
somebody needs to deal with it, but it's not us dealing with it, it's somebody else dealing with it, right? Um, so with Go, starting from Go 1.13, there is a nice way of dropping errors in the chain, right? So because we don't know what caused the error at Firestore um, initialization, right? It can be anything. Uh, we don't know what caused this error. So what we're doing is we're saying we have an error. We're saying error in Firebase in it, which is this error caused it, right? So we have kind of a nested chain of errors. It's like Java exceptions, right? When Java throws an exception, you have the stack trace of what caused that exception, what caused that exception, and blah, 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 right? So starting with goal 13, uh, you have the, this ability to chain errors as well. So we're saying there was an error before we had an error, and now we're throwing an error. So we're passing this error to whoever is handling it. And then whoever is handling it can recover can see our error, but can also see what was the error inside the Firebase, right? So escalating the error up the chain usually is a good idea, right? Uh, and then um, let's say you have this case. You have a case where Firebase is not working. A, a user asks something for your server. Your server tries to save something to Firebase and can't because it's not working. Should you crash? Of course you shouldn't crash. You shouldn't say, oh, yeah. A request just killed my app, right? Uh, you should say, well, your request was um, rejected because we have some problems. Or you could even send back a 500. You could send back that there is a server error and the request cannot be completed. But your server continues to run, right? It doesn't crash. It doesn't panic. Um, so you somehow handle it, uh, like up the chain. But inside, you tend to escalate the errors. All right, so init is kind of simple. Uh, close is even simpler. You just call close on the client. And now we have the saving thing. So as I was explaining before, um, I sort of like to have the ID with my documents. And therefore, what I'm doing here is I'm doing a save of student in two steps. OK, so the first step is I'm getting a new, new document, new completely empty document. But because I'm getting a reference to this document, I, I have an ID of that new empty document, right? So I want to save a student, but I don't know what uh, ID the student will have because I only want to use an auto-generated IDs from a Firestore. Um, so I got a new empty document. I have a reference to it. So I'm reading the ID of that, um, of that new empty document, and I'm saying, this student ID is this new empty document ID, right? So I populate uh, inside my student, um, which has an ID, which is a string, this new, um, new document uh, ID from the reference. And then, and I'm actually doing the save. So I'm saving now the student into the database, but my ID is already in the document, right? Um, so what's, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that I am passing a reference to my student. So whoever is saving the student, so let's say I have a, a new student, I created a new student, um, and now I, I saved it to a database. The reference I have in, in, in my Go space has a dot ID, and this ID points to the correct ID of that document already, right? So I can retrieve it, I can delete it, I can do certain things with this document straight away, right? Uh, so it makes kind of a convenient for me. Um, and then I'm handling the error the same way as before. So I'm escalating the error up the chain. If there is an error, if there is no error, we return nil. Um, and then with de deletion, uh, because we have IDs attached to the references, we retrieve the document um, from the collection, and then we call delete on that reference. So those calls always return you a reference, and then you can do something on the reference, either save it or uh, read, read, read from it. So um, let's read by ID first. Uh, so reading by ID, again, gives me a reference to a document. Um, so, so this one gives me a, a document reference. 
And then when I say get, I actually get the, the document itself, but it's in the internal format of the Firebase API. To convert it to my student, I have to do this call. Um, so I'm, I'm calling, um, I'm converting the internal representation of my document from Fire, Firestore into my representation, which is a student struct, right? It's the same as with the JSON parsing. It's just here, it's kind of, it's not really a parsing, it's kind of just conversion of the representation of the, of the document. Um, so I'm saying from this document, copy it to the struct, so then I'm returning kind of a nice student struct, right? This internal representation gives me flexibility. Like, it gives me the possibility of adding new properties to my document, which the normal uh, student rec doesn't. Um, and that's it. So I have uh, reading, deleting, and creating um, objects uh, done, implemented. I have it tested. So if I, um, if I say go test cover and I do the, the actual tests, uh, they will run. Uh, um, ah, yes, they don't run because I need this. Um, there is this. Uh, I have to make an environmental variable which points to this credentials file. Um, and then if I run it, it kind of uh, runs it and it says have all the tests pass and I have a 54% test coverage, right? Um, so I do that here again with bigger fonts. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm creating an environmental variable called Google Application Credentials. And from my service account, I downloaded this JSON uh, file with the credentials. And I need to have it in the environmental variable before I can actually con connect to Firebase. And then when I run it, I, I have it, right? Um, so very quickly about the tests. Um, the tests are organized in, into files which are underscore test. Um, so all the, if you have files, normal files, then for testing by convention, you're saying the same file name underscore test. And then the test functions um, start with the with capital T test. And then you have whatever you want, whatever you're testing. So for example, I'm testing the mock database um, and I'm doing some operations. And then you always for your test, you pass this parameter, which is the kind of a handle for the testing framework. Um, and then um, here I'm not doing anything. I'm just calling the methods and I'm expecting no errors. So I'm making sure that everything compiles and everything is linked correctly and my interfaces are implemented correctly and so on. And the parameters for the interface are done correctly. It's pretty much just a compilation test. Um, for the Firestore test, I'm actually creating new Alice. I'm storing it, I'm reading it, and then I'm deleting it and I'm trying to read it again and see if it's there, right? So it's a quite a longish test where I'm creating new instance storing it, making sure it's there, reading from it, making sure the references are the same, the documents are the same, deleting it, and making sure it's not there after deletion. Um, so you can have a look at the logic of the tests. And I basically have just two tests for, the, uh, for getting 50% coverage, because I'm touching all the methods. So I'm touching saving, deleting, reading, and so on, right? Um, your tests will not test your main method. So your main method usually is untested. So to obtain 100% coverage of your tests, you would have to call main, right? Uh, which usually is not good. Uh, so what we do is we keep main short. Uh, so then we can test most of the code and the main itself is so short that you don't need to test it. Um, right, um, that's it. Uh, there, there was a question about the deadlines. So we um, decided to change the deadline for assignment two to be Sunday upon requests from some students. But if anyone has object object objections, please let us know. So who would not like to have a extended deadline until Sunday midnight? Okay, so anonymously, we're changing the deadline to Sunday midnight. 
Um, we also realized with Christopher that in the f in the last week of lectures in November, neither me or him are here, so it would be unfair to have a deadline for the project when we're not here. So the deadline actually is also like the last week of um, of lectures. So it will be either 22nd or Sunday after the the thing, right? Again, up to you to agree on that. Um, we would like to have uh, presentations of the of the projects, and the presentation itself is not um, uh, it, it's not really part of the like teaching. It's more part of the assessment. So we can do that in the following week, right? So the lectures finish on twenty second of November, but on Monday we will do the project presentations. Um, I, I hope it's okay. We can again discuss it or make it more flexible. We, we have, I think, three weeks uh, which are given for exams to have the assessment. So the presentation can happen later if you want to as well. It can happen on Monday or it could happen a little bit later. Um, um, so it's up to you. So that's, that's all for today. Do you have any questions? All right, thank you.